Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to All Souls Unitarian Universalist. My name is Ruth Robarge. I'm a member of the congregation and acting as your moderator this morning. What a beautiful snowfall happening behind you. You are so very lucky to have gotten here. Best of luck getting home. <laughs> if you are uh, in need of any help in that area, please let a member of us, uh, a staff or another member of the congregation know. And if you are joining us on live stream, welcome. And aren't you smart this morning? <laughs> Oh, one of these days we're going to come in here and there's not going to be anyone. It's going to be bad weather. We're all going to be there on live stream. But that's, that'll be good, too. That'll be good, too. So we're all very grateful to be here this morning and uh, welcome here. Um, we'd like to remind people to go ahead, check in on social media, let people know you're here, post your tweets or Facebook or whatever, and then silence your phones. If something comes up that's really important in the middle of the service, of course, you will still be able to access them. Uh, we uh, want to welcome any, uh, we, besides welcoming everybody, we want to welcome any guests that may have come today. So if you uh, brought a guest and want to stand and introduce them, please do so at this time. Or if you brought yourself and feel like you could uh, introduce people, uh, you introduce yourself, you can stand and introduce yourself. Okay. I'm Emily Hodges from St. John's Unitarian in Cincinnati. I grew up here and Hodges. left my graduate from high school in 62, but I've been back a few times since. It's wonderful to be here. Welcome. Um, with Charles Spencer from <laughs> Southeast Iowa. Glad to be here. By welcome. Welcome. Yes. So if we need help with the snow, we know who to ask. Yes. Um, Robert and Julia, and we're from Austin, Texas, first year in Austin, Texas, and we'll be in town for a few weeks. Well, welcome. Welcome. Um, my sister, who's actually from Cincinnati, and my sister, and her three of her children are here, and um, she's one who actually told me about the do you thing, so she used it. Jesus, this church to me from afar. Yeah. Welcome. Well, very welcome to everyone. Uh, do stop by the welcome table out back if you have a, a chance and you're on your way out this afternoon. Uh, and we'll, uh, there'll be coffee and, and chatting and all that good stuff. Um, sounds great. All right. Welcome and thank you for coming today. And we will continue. Unarrest, see this at the core of all existing things. It was the eager wish to soar that gave the gods their wings. Their throbs through all the worlds that are this heart. Hot and strong, and shaken a system star by star, awake and glow in a song. But for the urge of this unrest, these joyous spheres are mute. But for the our breast had we remained as brutes when a baffled lips demanded speech speech trembled in a tumult one day the 
lyric world shall reach from earth to laughing earth. From a deed to dream, from dream to deed, from a daring hope to a hope, the restless wish, the instant need, still drove us up the slope. Sing a Stringing discontent that leaps from star to star. Good morning and welcome. Welcome, uh, thank you. Welcome officially to this holiday season, the time of shortening days and lengthening expectations of perilous weather and numerous projects. When we distract ourselves from winter's tightening grip with sparkly, shiny things, I hope that you had a pleasant and delicious Thanksgiving. I hope you are looking forward to solstice and Hanukkah and Christmas and Kwanzaa. I hope you do not actually forget to live these days, even now, in this time of preparation for other days to come. For as the ancient poet reminds us, it is only in the course of this very day that our lives happen. So look to this day, for it is life, the very life of life. Look to this hour of reflection here in the gathered community of memory and promise, for it is dedicated to the health of the human spirit. In this day's brief course, lie all the realities and verities of our existence, the bliss of growth, the splendor of action, the glory of power, all that eternities can offer is now set before us. The possibilities await only our vision and decisive action. Here in this covenant community, let our faith be restored, our energy renewed, that we might meet the challenges of life with joy and strength. For yesterday is but a dream, a remembered story of the past, and tomorrow is only a vision where no one can genuinely live until it shall arrive. But today, well-lived, makes every yesterday a dream of happiness, free from shame or regret. And every tomorrow, a vision of hope, holding out the promise of lives made new and a world redeemed. This day only are we given with certainty in which to discover truth and weave meaning in which to do our part of the continuing human venture. Look well, therefore, to this day. And let this chalice light of our gathering stand forth boldly amidst the gathering darkness of the year, proclaiming warmth to the lonely, clarity to the deceived, healing to all who are broken. May we be keepers of the flame, each in our own hearts, so that it shall be carried forth into the world, a beacon of freedom, welcome, and enduring hope. Good morning. My name is Sean, 
and I like this chalice for respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. Now I invite you to rise as you are willing and able and let us speak once again the words of our community's promise to one another. Together we affirm goodwill is the spirit of this church. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. Now I'm going to invite you to remain standing and sing out because we need everybody's voice and this should be familiar. Thank you. And you can be seated. Now I'm going to invite you to turn to someone who's sitting near you. Extra points if it's someone that you didn't come in with. And more extra points if it's someone who's more than 30 years younger than you. Um, so I'll leave you to make your own decision about that. And... Uh, and tell them good morning and congratulate them for getting here. And then I invite you to uh, ask them, what is their favorite kind of literature? What sort of book do you like to read? And that may be simple for some of our younger members and it more, may be more <coughs> complex for some of us who've had more opportunity to sample the varieties of literature. So see who, who's nearby that you can talk to. started a conversation that you're looking forward to continuing after the service ends. And right now, I'm, I'm sure there won't be regular classes, but I'm sure that there's some special activity for our young folks, and so we will let them depart with song. <laughs> Good morning. 
morning. I'm Sharon Cassidy, and I'm here to introduce to you Veterans Community Project. They are our special offering in November. Their programs reach out to help veterans in our community, both men and women. They are the Tiny Houses Project that you may have heard about uh, on TV. With the weather out there today, I know you can all relate to the situation of the men and women who stood up to serve us and now are in need of our help. You all are a generous congregation. You have donated almost a thousand pounds of food to harvesters this year. You have donated sweats to the vets this year. You have donated socks to the homeless in October. And we're asking you to share your generosity with the Veterans Community Project. Please, those of you online, as well as those of you here, fill out a check or put some money in the basket and help our men and women who helped us. In this spirit, this morning's offering will now be given and gratefully received. <laughs> Something to have wept as we have wept, and something to have done as we have done. It is something to have watched when all men slept and seen the stars which never. To have known the things that from the weak are felt, the fearful ancient passion strange and high, it is something to be wiser than the world, and something to be Will you join me now in the words of dedication for our offering? We dedicate our offerings and our actions to the mission at the heart of this congregation to build a respectful, caring community, to inspire personal and spiritual growth, and to create change toward a just and compassionate society. Eight passages from the scripture of Earth Seed from the Parable of the Sower by Octavia Butler. Passage one. All that you touch, you change. All that you change, changes you. The only lasting truth is change. God is change. Passage two. 
God is neither good nor evil nor loving nor hating. God is power. God is change. We must find the rest of what we need within ourselves, in one another, in our destiny. Passage 3. God is power, infinite, irresistible, inexorable, indifferent. And yet God is pliable, trickster, teacher, chaos, clay, beware. God exists to shape, to be shaped. God is change. Passage 4. Do not worship God. Inexorable God neither needs nor wants your worship. Instead, acknowledge and attend God. Learn from God. With forethought and intelligence, imagination and industry, shape God. When you must, yield to God. Adapt and endure for your earth seed. And God is change. Passage 5. A victim of God may, through learning and adaptation, become a partner of God. A victim of God may, through forethought and planning, become a shaper of God. Or a victim of God may, through short-sightedness and fear, remain God's victim, God's plaything, God's prey. Passage 6. When a parent's stability disintegrates as it must, since God is change, people tend to give in to fear and depression, to need and greed. When no influence is strong enough to unify people, they divide, they struggle one against one, group against group, for survival, position, power. They remember old hates and generate new ones, they create chaos and nurture it. They kill and kill and kill until they are exhausted and destroyed, until they are conquered by outside forces, or until one of them becomes a leader most will follow or a tyrant that most fear. Passage 7. To shape God with wisdom and forethought, to benefit your world, your people, your life, consider consequences, minimize harm, ask questions, seek answers, learn, teach. Passage 8. Your teachers are all around you. All that you perceive, all that you experience, all that is given to you are taken from you. All that you love or hate, need or fear, will teach you, if you will learn. Learn or die. It struck me that you rarely see images of black people projecting themselves into the future. When you do, it's almost always the post-apocalyptic type of future where the person is very isolated. If we imagine ourselves into the future, how are we going to be when we get there? Can we be agents of the future? Or will we be objects of the future, like we were objects of commerce when black folks were brought to the new world? Empowering people to see themselves and their ideas in the future gives rise to innovators and free thinkers who can pull from the best of the past while navigating the sea of possibilities to create communities, culture, and a new balanced world. While teaching yoga to a group of fifth grade African American girls, for some reason, I brought up the rover on Mars. I talked about space tourism and asked how many would be willing to take a ride. All hands shot up. One said she was going to ask her mom to start saving money so they could buy a ticket. Today the tickets are about $90,000.
but one day, not too far off, the prices will go down. Space tourism will be commonplace, and the fact that we lived in a time when it was not will sound like we lived in the age of the dinosaurs when we retell it. Perhaps this young girl, inspired by space travel, will create the latest flying car upgrade. Or maybe, as she's mapping out her Mars trip, she'll write a story about her future, her interstellar travels, and the life force she brings to this red planet neighbor. Perhaps, with a desire to improve the world's conditions, she'll link into a larger group of people with a shared vision of sustainability and equality. Starting with her imagination and implementing ideas through her actions, she'll live the future. The future is ours. Yes, the future is now. Butler died in the winter of 2006 at the age of 58. She did not live to see either Barack Obama or Donald Trump elected president of the United States, which is too bad because it would have been fascinating to see how she responded to those two events. 
What kind of stories might she have wanted to tell about our first black commander in chief and the frightening reactionary shifts that followed in American politics? Butler's first novel, Pattern Master, was published in 1976, the year of Jimmy Carter's election and the bicentennial of the Declaration of Independence. Pattern Master was the first commercially successful work of futuristic science fiction by a black woman author. It was followed by several sequel books set in the same imaginary universe as well as three other series in other alternate realities. Butler's most widely known novel is Kindred, published in 1979, a work of historical fiction in which the black heroine travels in time from the present era to the time of slavery, where she is forced to intervene in the lives of her black and white ancestors in order to ensure her own lineage. The enduring popularity of Kindred put Butler on a national stage where her work became one of the originating strands of the movement known as Afrofuturism. That movement has also found expression in music, in graphic arts, and in movies. Both the films Black Panther and Sorry to Bother You are recent examples of it. It is a cultural phenomenon that feels to me both surprising and completely to be expected. A message framed within the society of black America, addressed to and for itself willing to be observed by the dominant white power structure, but not necessarily concerned with its issues. This morning I want to explore from a white perspective, obviously, some of the dimensions of Afrofuturism. First, for the sake of our cultural literacy here, so that we might have some idea what is going on in our world, Second, for the sake of our congregational commitment to racial justice and understanding, so that we might gain some insight into what the folks of color in our communities may be thinking about. And third, for the sake of our own spiritual growth, to see how our sense of the world and its possibilities and the location of the holy could be expanded through this school of thought. There is much about Afrofuturism that I do not grasp. My age as well as my race is something of a barrier. And yet I am deeply intrigued as well as confused and somewhat uncomfortable with what I have learned so far. Octavia Butler turned to writing science fiction at a very young age in her early teens. Her literary ambitions crystallized one afternoon, sometime between her 10th and 12th year, depending on which account you read, when she watched on television with growing indignation an uninspired sci-fi movie entitled Devil Girl from Mars. It features a black spandex-clad female alien who arrives at a remote Scottish inn for the purpose of kidnapping human men to breed with on Mars. Give or take the allure of black spandex, Butler immediately felt that she could write a more engaging version of such a story. Movie critics of the time would not have been disposed to disagree with her. Within hours, as she tells it, she had written her first science fiction short story about a young girl taken on a tour of the galaxy by aliens. And soon she was sending that and other works to potential publishers. 
Though quite unsuccessful in terms of publication, she would continue these efforts throughout her high school and college years. Although she would remain for most of the end of the 20th century, even after she was successful, one of the very few black science fiction writers, and for all practical purposes, the only black woman in the field, the genre opened three important possibilities for Butler as an author. First, it allowed her to imagine characters of color in situations and outcomes that ha would have been highly unrealistic for the actual world of black experience. They could be powerful people in leadership roles with victorious endings such as had never played out on the stage of this world's history. Second, she could create a vision of the future not controlled or populated exclusively by white men and their concerns, which was the dominant motif of typical sci-fi writers and readers of her era. Finally, and most important, the interplanetary stage enabled Butler to examine the concept of being alien and the meaning of human versus non-human in a way that unpacked with varying levels of subtlety the black experience of alienation and dehumanizing in American culture. Butler's writing and Afrofuturism in general also contains a prophetic strand. It often extrapolates from current cultural, political, or scientific trends to speculate about what could happen if those trends continue unchecked. Her parable or Earth Seed series, which stood tantingly unfinished at the time of her death, is a significant example. We know from her unpublished outlines and sketches that Butler envisioned a multi-part series that would trace the stories of numerous space colonies that all set out as earth seeds at the same time, observing how their definition of humanity and their understanding of the human condition evolved differently depending on the conditions they encountered on the new planets they inhabited. Whether or not they met sentient beings and whether or not the groups were able to communicate, the environmental situations, hostile or benign, that they faced. She saw it as almost a kind of controlled experiment, starting as much as possible with similar preconditions and then isolating certain variables in order to ponder the impact that they might have. In Butler's mind, as in other Afrofuturist works, the futuristic journey to the stars was a kind of parallel to the Middle Atlantic Passage for generations of Africans kidnapped into slavery, arriving as alien creatures to an alien land and culture. How did the ancestors make sense out of an experience for which there could be no preparation and no morally coherent explanation? Butler intended to wrestle with this riddle, but the two volumes of the series that she actually completed only served to establish the backstory on Earth of how those colonizing efforts came to exist. The Earth she envisions in the not very distant future is dying of global climate change, and the political infrastructure of the once united states has crumbled to anarchy and fascism. In this dystopian society, a young black woman concludes that the only way to ensure humanity's survival is to create a community whose mission is to send out earth seed, human space colonies, and that the most effective way to accomplish this 
is to teach a novel religion. You heard some passages from its scriptures a few moments ago in the reading. The process of building that community in the midst of post-apocalyptic chaos and the unfolding of its spiritual teachings occupy the first volume, the parable of the sower. The sequel, Parable of the Talents, deals with the unexpectedly powerful resistance of the Christian right, as well as the cost of sacrificing immediate relationships for the sake of longer-term goals. This latter question is particularly poignant in the light of traumatized cultural memories of the forcible separations of slave parents from their children and married couples from each other. It is also probably not irrelevant that Butler's own mother died during the writing of this specific book. As you may begin to perceive, Octavia Butler's science fiction is not easy reading. Although her leading characters are sometimes quite young at the beginning of the story, I would argue that her work does not really belong in the young adult category. Her understanding of human nature is complex and ethically ambiguous. Her take on history is a sequence of moral forced surrenders by individuals under the domination of implacable and arbitrary forces, whether that be technologically superior space aliens or white supremacy and slavery. In college, Butler once heard a black activist classmate express his frustration with the elder generations accommodating the structures of racial segregation. I'd like to kill off all these old people who've been holding us back for so long, he announced, but I can't because I would have to start with my own parents. Butler realized that she also despised the way her mother was treated by the people she worked for as a maid. But the fact that her mother accepted this without protest was what kept them both fed and sheltered and allowed Octavia to grow up. She went on to write the novel Kindred, in which a heroine with contemporary sensibilities is forced to decide how to respond to the dilemmas of life as a slave. The character Dana and the reader both come to understand that individual resistance was often both futile and dangerous, and that there is heroism in sheer survival. Sometimes the only way to survive was to become complicit, to accommodate the evil. But this was what made any kind of future possible. This theme shows up again and again in Butler's writing. There is always suffering. And the point is not to make it stop, but to endure and survive so that other possibilities have a chance to arise. She never had children herself, but it was a larger form of living on that interested her, the survival of a people, a race, a species. Another aspect of survival that she examined was change. As you have heard in the invented religion of Earthseed, she explores the idea that God is change, the one constant of the universe and of human experience. All of the encounters that Butler sets up between humans and other creatures revolve around how much either can change the other or how much both can change before what they were to start with is destroyed or turned into something definitively different. This is not surprisingly one of the questions raised by Afrofuturism more broadly, and it is one that troubles the waters of our society generally. How do we value what is distinctive about a particular culture? Let us say, for example, black culture in 20th century America. 
without implicitly disparaging or demonizing all that it is not? How do we remain faithful to any given value? For example, honesty or mercy or respect. When the world around us changes and the old ways no longer lead to the same results. Each of Butler's characters is challenged to persist in a struggle to hold on to something precious while encountering the overwhelming forces of change. We can't stop change, she affirms in the Earthseed Gospel. We can only try through wisdom, forethought, imagination, and learning to shape change, not to control it, but to give it a push in the direction that makes sense to us. Dana, the heroine of Kindred, cannot control the way that life and death and pain unfold for her ancestors, but she can nudge events in the direction of a future and a legacy that includes her own life as a free woman more than a century later. Afrofuturism is above all an act of imagination, the envisioning of a world that has never yet existed. One of Butler's later short stories entitled The Book of Martha consists of a conversation between a black narrator and God who morphs during the course of the conversation from a conventional white man with a beard to a black woman by the end. This God offers Martha, the narrator, the opportunity to change one thing about the human condition that will serve to improve the world and the lives of people in it. God assigns her this power and responsibility somewhat against her will, but can only suggest some of the possible consequences of her decision, not guarantee an outcome. After talking herself out of several other ideas, in the end, Martha settles on giving all human beings intense and fulfilling dreams in the hope that if their lives contain that amount of satisfaction, they might not be so ambitious for power in their waking lives and so willing to make others suffer in order to attain that power. God too is curious what effect this change will have on humanity as a whole. Afrofuturism often imagines this kind of curious learning co-suffering God as a cosmic partner in the human project of creating a livable society. It may be, like much of Butler's writing, intensely dystopian in its vision of reality in the present and near time future, but its longer vision is not utopian. This is illustrated well in the movie Black Panther where the imagined hidden kingdom of Wakanda is not without challenge, stress, and human fallibility. The crucial ingredient, as always, is the hope for legacy and healing, a future with a continuing connection of gratitude to the past. Afrofuturism is a creative resolution of past and present trauma by envisioning a future, not of perfection, but of wholeness, in which the pain of history is integrated both by individuals and by the culture as a whole. Octavia Butler also urged her characters, and by extension her readers, to bear fruit in spite of the very real reasons for despair. Survival itself is a virtue and an achievement against the odds not to be scorned. Yet survival has a direction and a collective purpose. We hold on and hang in for the sake of what we can envision, for the sake of the stories we tell each other 
about a world that might yet be. This vision is organic and open. It is the opposite of empire's constant grasping for greater control. As Yatasha Womack says, perhaps with a desire to improve the world's conditions, we'll link into a larger group of people with a shared vision of sustainability and equality. Starting with our imagination and implementing ideas through our actions, we'll live the future. This is the heroism that Butler advocates and that Afrofuturism celebrates. It is not a white male gladiator who, with a small team of helpers, imposes his will and eliminates all danger. That is the myth of empire and the seedbed of oppression. Rather, it is a more modest, shared longing for a world of less harm, a collective vision that cannot work if it leaves out any part or fails in reciprocity, respect, or mutuality. In this version, violence is not a tool for the creation of order, but rather a failure of imagination and community. Violence is a reality to be acknowledged with grieving, including the impulse which dwells within each one of us, and then to be reimagined with the shaping power of change. Octavia Butler realized that if only white men tell stories about what the future might be, then that future will always conform to the ways in which white men see the world. She worked consciously to put herself and people like herself into the stories of what it might mean when humans encounter non-humans, because those concepts are so deeply embedded in the history of her people. She worked through story to untie the knots of generational trauma that keep our communities from our best resilience and creativity. She helped to originate a movement that would see both black experience and black imagination as important resources in a troubled world. She invited us all into a new Copernican revolution to take our species and by implication our race out of the center of our picture of the universe. That move is an act of imagination so demanding that we can only sustain it for short periods of time. She challenged us to stretch that capacity because in it might lie the possibility of our survival as a species and our salvation. Let's stand and sing together. Yeah. 
we extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fires of commitment. For all these we carry in our minds and hearts until we are together again. <clears throat> there will always arise from any success, no matter how great, an even greater challenge. Therefore, go your ways, knowing not the answers to all things, but seeking always the answer to one more thing than you know. Go in peace. Thank <laughs> you.